Uh, Senator so, Ardham, you have uh, to call. If you may, um, before uh, you close the debate, um, this is uh, a matter that uh, actually brought me into politics in the first place, and so I'm very pleased to speak on this motion today. Um, as much as Senator Abetz would like us to believe that the Australian government has a mandate to simply bash these bills through without comment, I would remind him that the Australian people has seen fit to hang the numbers in this chamber. The fact that we have the largest ever assembly of crossbenchers, uh, people who have not yet had time to even read the bills, let alone critique them and come to an informed view, which is why we engage in committee processes in the first place. And the fact that Mr Abbott does control the numbers in the House of Representatives, which is why we've seen debate there uh, approach the proportions of a sham. The fact is the Senate works very differently, and thank goodness it does. We've got the most diverse upper house probably in the history of the Federation. And I think given the importance of the bills that we're dealing with, the very least that we could do is pay the committee the respects that it, is, that it deserves, the time to actually produce and table its report. Now, I'll be very clear. This is one matter and one bill on which I have made up my mind. This is the most important issue facing this parliament today and other parliaments and assemblies around the world. The issue of what kind of policy we bring into the age of climate change, that we have committed ourselves already to dangerous climate change, to dangerous degrees of global warming. And the question now is whether we plunge on and commit ourselves and our children to catastrophic climate change, where the emergency services and the ability of societies to adapt to what is coming down the line is in fact overwhelmed. We've also heard Senator Abetz and others uh, on the government <laughs> benches adopting this very thin veneer of pretending to care about climate change, which is where I think um, the lie is given and the cat is let out of the bag by the fact that they are still happy and content to adopt a 5 per cent target, which is so brazenly at odds with what the scientific community has been telling us for decades, as to be treated, I think, as no more than a sham. And that's why the government's direct action policy that it's brought forward should be seen for what it is. It is policy designed by people who couldn't care less if it works or not. Because through some strange artefact, you appear to have decided that what the weather itself is doing at the moment is some kind of socialist conspiracy. How utterly bizarre. Otherwise, intelligent, reasonable legislators, educated people could somehow bring themselves to believe that NASA and CSIRO and the Hadley Centre and the Bureau of Meteorology all got it wrong and uh, Lord Monckton somehow got it right. Actually, I shouldn't address him as a lord, should I? The House of Lords have asked that he not be addressed as a lord, so I won't. That somehow people like Andrew Bolt have got it right, with a global climate science community have somehow become engaged and enmeshed in a socialist conspiracy. Really, what are you people huffing in your party room that that is where you've got to? These bills should stand. The idea that you would rip $18 billion out of the economy, a direct transfer to vulnerable Australians, to energy efficiency throughout the business community, to changing the tax scales to protect people who can least afford the increases in electricity prices, and bearing in mind that the overall impact, more or less exactly as Treasury predicted, the overall impact is equal to about a third the cost impacts of the introduction of the GST. About a third. That's what we're talking about. And those who were unable to pay for that were compensated, and indeed, as Senator Milne reminds us, were overcompensated. And perhaps even more importantly, transferring some of that money from dirty industry to the clean energy industries of the future. It's a package that wasn't perfect, but it's a lot better than what this current government proposes to do, which is to simply throw a wrecking ball through it. You'll be throwing a wrecking ball through Australian industry, and while you stand across the other side of the chamber bemoaning the demise of manufacturing in this country, the fact that you were setting out to systematically sabotage the clean energy sector, which has extraordinary manufacturing potential for Australia, particularly for my state of WA, which has been dubbed the Saudi Arabia of sunlight, shows that you simply cannot be taken seriously. That, in fact, this is policy designed by people who have managed to persuade themselves 
that the most serious public policy issue facing this country in the 21st century simply doesn't exist. How nice that must be for you to wake up in the morning simply believing that it's not there, that it's just not true, it just isn't happening. You wake up and you tighten that blindfold around your eyes and you come in here in parliament and try and persuade the rest of the country that simply because you've deluded yourselves into believing this isn't real, that we should go that way as well and that we should believe it. Well, it is real. It is an uncomfortable truth. It is indeed an inconvenient truth, but it is the truth. You can't argue with the weather. You can't debate the composition of the atmosphere. So as you bring forward these repeal bills, the Australian Greens are of the view that they should be debated. We are of the view that the committee should be allowed to report. We are strongly of the view that the new crossbenchers and the other senators uh, on the backbench of the Labor and Liberal and National parties should be given the opportunity, given the gravity of these measures, to read the bills, to analyse exactly what it is that you're proposing to do and to form a considered view, and then, I would hope, to consign these repeal bills to the dustbin of history. Because as Senator Milne mentioned before, people will be looking back at these debates and they will be asking how on earth Australia became the first and only industrialised country in the world to roll back a functional carbon price instrument. I'm a little tired of being accused of being a socialist, for being one of the ones uh, promoting a flexible pricing instrument to deal with this public policy question. Straight out of the Karl Marx playbook, that one. The idea that you would have a market instrument to sort out the most efficient and most rapid way of restructuring the electricity markets around the country, driving industry and householders towards more efficient consumption of energy and thereby lowering bills, and eventually eliminating electricity bills when the renewable energy infrastructure is completely in place. Somehow you've established in your own minds that a floating market instrument as one component of public policy for dealing this issue is somehow a socialist initiative. How utterly bizarre. You have completely taken leave of reality. It's not the only thing. Uh, the Australian Greens believe that one of the most important areas of this bill, one of the most important components of the clean energy package, which the coalition also proposes to wreck, uh, is the construction and investment of the next generation of renewable energy power stations. Things like solar thermal plants. Uh, Senator Hanson Young and Senator Wright, I think, were buoyed uh, over recent days with the announcement that Alinta, themselves a very substantial fossil player, are now undertaking a feasibility study into converting uh, that section of South Australia's power grid to solar thermal, to a dedicated solar thermal plant. That fires the starting gun for me. I think we're going to beat you, Senator Wright. I think the gold fields in WA will be the first one to get one of those built. We look forward to the competition. Maybe Senator Waters like, might like to step up for the western part of Queensland. Our continent is drenched in sunlight, and this is the fuel for the power stations of the future. And you can try and roll it back all you like, and maybe you will be successful today, Senator Abetz, uh, through you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Maybe you will succeed in these procedural shenanigans to have these bills brought on and rammed through. But I don't think you actually are aware of just how rapidly the electricity sector is changing. What's being posed is the so-called death spiral for the black power generators in the network business, at least on the east coast of Australia, is in fact, I think, the sign of an industry being born, an industry that we desperately need to perform and outperform expectations as it has been doing. So you can sit there and you can study your repeal bills and you can craft your speeches about toxic taxes and you can rehearse the same tired talking points that got you through last September because people genuinely believed your campaign of of, uh, of fear-mongering that Wyala would be wiped off the map, that people would be priced out of their homes, that electricity bills would go through the roof. None of it happened. And that's why it didn't work when it came to the West Australian by-election. The talking points no longer worked. The stale lines that you were rolling out meant that your vote collapsed by another 5 per cent, the combined vote of the coalition. Not a glitch, not the kind of bump that always happens in by-election, the continuation of a long-term decline in the Liberal Party vote was 50 per cent of the West Australian vote a decade ago, now it's 34, and we knocked another 5 per cent off you while you were out there flailing your arms about talking about the toxic carbon tax. The Greens recorded their strongest ever vote in Western Australia in the Senate. So the reason, I guess, that it's not working anymore is that the fear campaign was exposed as hollow. Wyala is still chugging along pretty nicely. Alinta is now proposing solar thermal in South Australia. 
The mining industry, the off-grid miners, are the ones first in the queue in Western Australia to eliminate their diesel fuel bill and their gas bill by building solar plants at their mining operations. The politics have changed, the policy has changed, and the air is warming around us. So all I can do is urge the crossbenchers uh, to join with the Greens in opposing this motion, in taking time and giving these bills due consideration, because there won't be, in my view, certainly in this term of parliament, a more important set of bills that we deal with. We cannot be the first country in the world to roll back a functional carbon price that is actually changing the structure of electricity markets, at least on the east coast. It is driving emissions down in the electricity sector, and we are finally seeing that economic tipping point where the next generation of renewable energy technology and the increasing economic uh, advantages of eliminating your fuel bill, your coal, your gas and your oil bill, it's finally, the penny is finally dropping that that revolution is here. And If you think you can hold that back with these votes today, you're mistaken. But maybe you will manage to cost us five years as Australian industry slips further backwards down the curve, outcompeted by the United States, by the Chinese, by the Middle East. They also have a fair amount of sunlight there. Is that really what you're after? You won't be able to say you weren't warned. You went into this with your eyes open. So I look forward to committing to the vote uh, proper due consideration of these bills rather than this reckless headlong rush that you're engaged in on behalf of your donors in the coal, oil and gas industries. Thank you.